We're up to 20 already. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, I heard you know. I'm just putting people on at random if anybody wants to say hello. I don't know if anybody does. David, could you put that PDF in the general chat, the PDF link? Yeah, it's in the chat. I don't see it. I wonder why. You might have to put it up again. Because if people are joining late, they won't see like the previous messages in the chat. Yes, that's right. Yeah, so you might you might actually have to put it up like maybe a few times. <laughs> oh no, I gotta do this. This is the problem. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. I was only giving it to uh, to one person. That's what I thought. I do that all the time. Yeah, there's some ins and outs here. Well, uh, does anybody have anything they'd like to comment on early with uh, the PDF? Actually, we got one question, Jonathan. Uh, during um, the, the final chapter of Triumph of the Therapeutic, uh, Philip Reef, is that how you pronounce it? It's pronounced Reef, right? Reef, yes. Reef, yeah, that's what I thought. Uh, uh, Reef talked a, a, a bit about a British technologist that he uh, took issue with and quoted extensively, but did not name. By any remote chance, do you happen to know who that technologist was that he was referring to? The last chapter of Triumph? In Triumph, yes. I could probably bring it up. Let's see if we can do that. There persists a revolutionary impulse throughout the West, but it is cultural rather than political and therefore more difficult to describe than the political revolutions of the East. That revolutionary impulse is in evidence not only in the writings of those specimen therapeutics examined in pre preceding chapters, but in the writings and conversations of significant numbers of the educated. One British technologist has enunciated the doctrine of the therapeutic in a language so simple and clear that it is well, worth, well worthwhile to quote him at length to stand for countless other utterances heard and read. Quote, any religious exercise is justified only by being something men do for themselves, that is, for the enrichment of their own experience. Attached as he is to the word Christian, the writer even seeks to make Jesus out to be a therapeutic, as Lawrence and Reich did before him. Jesus, we learned, we learn, used the word God to refer to the vital energy of personal life itself, the energy of love. Living in a culture no longer religious, people who center their lives on ritual, sacrament, and constant reference to some supposed plan underlying experience are just as cut off from the vital personal contact with others. 
as is the individual neurotic. Anyway, the question I got was, well, who was the British technologist that he was quoting? I haven't the slightest idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it would be very difficult to figure that out. He probably um, didn't want to name it. He probably wasn't willing to do that. <laughs> The one British figure uh, who Reef knew, C.P. Snow, who wrote the famous book on the two cultures. Um, I'm sure he's not referring to him. I'll check into it and get back to you. Oh, OK. Dan, you can ask if you want. Yeah, I just typed in the chat. I, I wonder if there's uh, any kind of nod to the uh, film Triumph of the Will, you know, in Rife's, <laughs> Reef's uh, book title. <laughs> I re... Uh printed a, a piece that Reef wrote, I believe in the 50s, I'll tell you, that may help to answer that question a bit and is well worth reading. Um, it was called it's 1953, The Aesthetic Functions in Modern Politics. And I'm, I'm pretty sure he may have made some reference to Triumph of the Will. He certainly was interested in the, the, nature, the, the uses of uniforms and the a particular dress that signified authority and He, he continued in that mode of thinking of the role of aesthetics, uh, not only in politics, but in culture in general. Uh, so his last uh, trilogy of, of works have a great deal of assessment and presentation of art. Duchamp, well, the names are endless. In fact, uh, we worked for a couple of years uh, in the process of getting some of the manuscript published to figure out how to get permissions to reproduce these images. Sometimes they're in the public domain, sometimes uh, they belong to someone and you have to pay exorbitant prices. But uh, the University of Virginia three volume Sacred Order, Social Order, uh, has a lot of uh, pictorial illustrations that uh, somehow permissions to reprint them were gained. So that's a, a long answer to a short question. <laughs> yeah. All right, I think we are uh, at the hour. So we should, uh, let's get started, 41 participants. I'll start the uh, recording. Uh, welcome, everyone. This is our second presentation on a philosopher uh, presentation that uh, I'm interested in, and I hope everyone else is interested in. Uh, these are figures that I think are underrepresented in contemporary philosophy, certainly people who are very wide-ranging thinkers and need to be better known than they are. And certainly uh, Philip Reef falls in that category. I found his writings to be an extraordinary eye-opening critique of civilization and society. And I have asked Jonathan Imber to give a presentation today on Philip Reef's work and his life and what he had to say about modernity.
and the modern condition. And I think this is going to be very, very enlightening for many people who aren't familiar with Philip Reef. So with that, I would like to give the floor over to Professor Jonathan Ember. Thank you, David. Uh, welcome to everyone who's here in a virtual sense. Uh, I look forward to telling you uh, a variety of things this evening uh, and also look forward to uh, questions you may have, uh, whether I can answer them all, as you just saw illustrated with the question about uh, triumph of the will, I can't guarantee. I, I should say that uh, on a personal note, I came, uh, I, I did my undergraduate work at Brandeis University. I graduated in 1974. Uh, and one of my teachers at that time suggested that I might learn a lot if I went and studied with Philip Reef at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, in those days, uh, the graduate schools in sociology that were particularly well-known and had high status like Yale and Harvard and Berkeley. Penn was in the running, but uh, wasn't as important uh, so in sociology. But I applied and I got in and I went to study with Philip Reef because I wrote a review of his uh, 1972 book, Fellow Teachers, which I highly commend to anyone who is interested in the fate that he saw and wrote about with respect to the university. I want to talk a little bit about that as we go on. Uh, I'm going to do a couple of things that may be a little different, and David's going to help me out. Uh, in, in a bit. Let me start by uh, offering some basic facts. Phil Brief was born in, uh, on December 15th, 1922 in Chicago. Uh, he grew up there and eventually served in the military, in the Air Force, uh, and then came back to the University of Chicago where he uh, not only completed his undergraduate degree, but eventually his graduate dissertation on Freud. He died on July 1st, 2006 at the age of 83. So he would be uh, this coming December, uh, 98 years old. So I said he taught at Brandeis in his early career and then at the University of Pennsylvania for three decades as the Benjamin Franklin Professor of Sociology. Uh, I want to mention his major works uh, and consider them briefly chronologically. First is uh, Freud, The Mind of the Moralist, uh, which was published in 1959. It received widespread accolades and was central to Reef being regarded as an important intellectual interlocutor in the 1950s and 1960s. The chapter you've been asked to read from that work, The Emergence of Psychological Man, what he called uh, uh, the coda to the mind of the moralist in his next book, The Triumph of the Therapeutic, established Reef as among the first to raise concerns about the modal type of personality he said was appearing in, in increasing numbers, especially in the United States, a psychological man. With his next book, The Triumph of the Therapeutic, Uses of Faith After Freud in 1966, Reef's uh, presence in the intellectual firmament actually began to fade. I can discuss this in more detail later if you're interested. Uh, it has to do with his personal life more than his intellectual life, but the two kind of crossed each other and 
he was seen less in the public seek, uh, precincts of uh, intellectual writers, the New York Times Book Review, uh, the intellectual journals of the time, partisan review and the like, which he had published and commentary, which he had published in uh, a good deal in the 1950s. Triumph, however, even more than the mind of the moralist, brought the term therapeutic culture into a larger public discourse where it remains to this day. It may be among one of the more familiar ideas that at this point may not even be attributed to Reef. Uh, the Triumph of Therapeutic was released uh, for a number of years uh, by a publisher who added uh, commentary on it. Uh, and one of the important writers who wrote the introduction uh, to the reprinting was Elizabeth Lash Quinn. And I don't know if you are all familiar with her. Her father was uh, Christopher Lash, uh, who Reef often said and I think he was being trying to be humorous, uh, took Reef's uh, more difficult ideas and made them more under, uh, Lash made them more understandable to a larger public. Uh, thus, uh, Lash's book, uh, The Culture of Narcissism, uh, which we should all still be reading today. I would point out that in his, uh, uh, when he started out at the University of Pennsylvania in the early 1960s, he oversaw the publication of the 10 volume collected papers of Sigmund Freud, each with an introductory essay that he wrote. Three of those uh, introductions are reprinted in the volume that I edited in 1990, uh, The Feeling Intellect. By the early 1970s, Reef is largely said to have retreated from public view. Coincident, I would argue, with figures who emerged and were labeled as, quote, public in intellectuals, unquote, a term that cuts in many directions. Um, a confluence of forces, both cultural and technological, brought public intellectuals into a limelight that only grew in notice in the years that followed. You can get a good handle of this phenomena in a book by a Tufts political scientist named Daniel Dresner called The Ideas Industry, how pessimists, partisans, and plutocrats are transforming the marketplace of ideas. That was published a couple of years ago. In that light, in the rise of the public intellectual, at least by my reckoning. Reef's, what I would call his stage presence, which had been fairly prominent in the intellectual journals of the 1950s, that stage presence became the classroom, exemplified in his 1973 book, Fellow Teachers, which began as a public lecture at Skidmore College uh, two years before. That work encapsulated Reef's chief concern for the next three decades. He saw the university as the embodiment of culture, of high culture, as he termed it. Of course, today he is probably regarded, if remembered at all, as a critic of the university, starting with the student revolts of the 1960s and 70s, not unlike the concerns of others, in, including a, uh, another important book published two years before fellow teachers by Robert Nisbet called The Degradation of the Academic Dogma. Criticism of and care for the role of the university as we understand it, uh, and as Reef, I believe, would have said, started with John Henry Cardinal Newman's public lectures in 1852, which became his famous book on the idea of a university. I've been very interested in uh, Reef's interest in this. Uh, and because of that, 
uh, I spent some time assembling a collection of books, which I'd be happy, whose titles I'd be happy to share with anyone interested, uh, that included uh, Ortega y Gasset, uh, Carl Jaspers, John Sparrow, J.M. Cameron, Michael Oakeshott, George Marsden, and, and others, all, all who have written books since the, uh, the, the end of the Second World War, uh, assessing the fate of the university. Reef was in that line of thinking. So between 1973 and 2005, Reef published several important articles and reviews and spent the bulk of his time before he was compelled to retire from the University of Pennsylvania in 1993 at work on what became his three volume magnum opus, Sacred Order, Social Order. Let me say uh, a word or two about that. I said he was compelled to retire in 1993. I mentioned at the beginning that he was born in on December 15th, 1922. If he had been born on January 1st, 1923, he would not have been forced to retire. And he had, he was forced to retire because on January 1st, 1993, uh, Congress in the previous year had enacted a law that eliminated mandatory retirement of college professors at the age of 70. It's one of those little known things that uh, sent a kind of chill through academia at first because uh, it was thought that everybody, uh, every professor would hold on until they were 90. Uh, where I work and where I live, uh, there's nobody holding on to their 90. Um, but Reef would have, uh, would have stayed. And uh, he took camp at uh, the medical what was then called the Medical College of Pennsylvania, where he, worked fairly well and gave uh, a series of lectures his first year. But in his second year, he had a stroke, lost vision in one eye, and uh, never, never returned uh, to full-time uh, teaching or uh, a university position. Um, He lived to see the uh, publication of the first volume of Sacred Order, Social Order, which is uh, entitled My Life Among the Death Works, colon, Illustrations of the Aesthetics of Authority. There's that term aesthetics again. The subsequent two volumes, uh, as well as another work entitled Charisma, The Gift of Grace and How It Has Been Taken Away from Us, were published posthumously. One was uh, entitled The Crisis of the Officer Class, subtitled below that, The Decline of the Tragic Sensibility. And the third one, all, all published by the University of Virginia Press. The Jew of Culture, sub, sub, subtitled Freud, Moses, and modernity. Regarding my own association with Philip Reef, uh, I was his doctoral student from 1974 until 1979 when I received my PhD in sociology. During those years, I was a student in his seminar on sociological theory. I was a recidivist, a, a repeat participant which was organized each term around Reef's choice of a particular text, including Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil, Kafka's In the Penal Colony, and the short piece entitled Before the Law, Paul, the Apostle Paul's Letter to the Romans, among other works. We spent an entire term on the preface to Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil, 
Does anybody know its first its opening question in the preface? Supposing truth is a woman, comma, what then? <laughs> if you know anything about mainstream sociology and the canon of sociological theory, you would instantly recognize that none of the authors or texts I just mentioned are even remotely included. Some might conclude that Reef was playing a dangerous game with sociology graduate students who would be unlikely to assign such works to a class of sociology graduate students, much less undergraduate sociology majors. I never have, uh, but that's another story. But Reef was not enabling us to teach sociology in the conventional manner. He was educating us in what could be seen in these incredibly powerful works, what could be understood about ourselves, about human nature, and about society. I edited the bulk of Reef's writings in 1990, entitled The Feeling Intellect, Selected Writings. At the end of the volume, I selected 40 sentences taken from his writings. The word sentences has several meanings beyond the mere grammatical. A sentence is also a judgment of time to be served. The great Harrow in Kafka's In the Penal Colony, for instance, is after all a final sentence. Reef's teaching of that text as I look back at it periodically was about two death sentences. The second death is of the soul. If you listen to Reef lecture that uh, I think David uh, gave a uh, URL, a URL address that Reef gave in Australia in the early 1980s, you can learn a lot uh, about this second sentence. For my purposes here, I want to review some of the sentences I gathered at the end of the feeling intellect. I'm doing this extemporaneously in keeping with Reef's own pedagogical intentions. Uh, he would have criticized me for having prepared what I've just gone through and written it down. Uh, the lecture he gave in Australia uh, was typical of the way that he lectured without a note and quite coherent. In fact, I would argue as I have over the years that his public lectures, and he gave uh, a number of uh, very prestigious ones, the Terry lectures at Yale, the Gauss lectures at Princeton, uh, lectures in uh, Montreal, one of which was attended by uh, the then Cardinal Ratzinger who became Pope Benedict. Uh, he, he had that kind of influence uh, that I think if I'm not mistaken, uh, your host this evening, David, picked up on and referred to that there's something about the way that Reef wrote and thought uh, that is uh, exceedingly engaging. And I had argued for a number of years that uh, it would have been more valuable, I think, uh, for his legacy to have reprinted his, his lectures rather than uh, the, the three volume trilogy that uh, was eventually published based on his manuscripts. Uh, they're pretty dense. Even the mind of the moralist uh, is already an indication and the triumph of the therapeutic uh, uh, for many was more difficult, largely because uh, Figures like Wilhelm Reich and D.H. Lawrence <laughs> are not uh, easy reads either. But what I want to do uh, in keeping with his pedagogical intentions uh, is to go through some of these sentences uh, in order to elaborate some of Reef's major theoretical ideas, uh, including uh, interdicts, remissions, and transgressions as well as first, second, and third culture. So David, uh, I, I see you're, you have a, that must be a rabbit with one foot kicked up. 
Is it possible to display the um, sentences starting with the first page? Yes. <laughs> Let me uh, pull that up. So the thing to do is share screen. There we are. Yes. OK. So if people can see uh, and read these sentences, let's start with the first one. I'll read it. Psychological man is, of course, a myth, but not more of a myth than other model men around whom we organize our self-interpretations. I am merely announcing his presence, fluttering in all of us a response to the absent God. You should have read that in the PDF because it's in the Triumph of the Therapeutic. Um, it's what he referred to uh, in the Triumph Therapeutic uh, as the coda to the mind of the moralist, in other words, the emergence of psychological man. Here's what's interesting is that uh, in the beginning of the emergence of psychological man, the last chapter of the mind of the moralist, Reef uh, gives us a thumbnail sketch of the evolution of types of man, of types of human beings, of types of persons, uh, starting with uh, uh, Plato and political man, uh, evolving to religious man. Uh, with a short stop, he argues, of economic man and finally the emergence of psychological man. Now it's clear that these types do not represent an, any particular period of time, uh, the totality of uh, personality and character. But I think what he was uh, uh, trying to suggest at the end of the mind of the moralist is that Freud in particular had an enormous impact in recognizing the way in which human personality had begun to define itself less institutionally and more individually. So as a sociologist, I think Reef would have argued and did in, in many cases try to argue that this particular personality, this particular type of character, uh, where the focus was so powerfully a part of who people thought they were, what became important to them, how they understood themselves, invited uh, certainly after the Second World War, uh, the rise uh, of what Reef came to call and others have confirmed therapeutic culture. What is uh, this announcement then that Reef uh, uh, has, has made here? It's actually intended to be, I think, prophetic in precisely the way that he understood prophecy as a calling back rather than a prediction forward. Of course, uh, when he wrote this in The Triumph of the Therapeutic, 1966, he was already uh, uh, thinking about what had been lost institutionally uh, in terms of people's uh, particularly religious commitments. Um, it's interesting to note if uh, I mentioned a book that uh, was published posthumously called uh, on Charisma, that book was actually, the manuscript for it 
uh, was written soon after Triumph of the Therapeutic was published. So uh, it, it really uh, is taking into account a period be between roughly 1966 and 1973 when Fellow Teachers was published. And uh, he never, he wrote in Fellow Teachers that uh, he didn't let it out of his hands because he did, it wasn't, I think he, the expression was, it wasn't as tight as a drum yet. Uh, but by the time he uh, was in his late 70s and early 80s, uh, he thought that it still had something to say. And I think that's true. Uh, and so he enlisted a number of his former undergraduate students uh, to put it together, one of whom was actually in publishing. Uh, so that book on charisma uh, was a much uh, stronger statement uh, about the loss uh, of institutional connection uh, that he uh, sought in a prophetic mode to find a way to reinstate. I don't think that's happened. Uh, I'm not sure it will, uh, but that was his understanding of uh, his own announcement. So look at number three. Uh, a universal culture is a contradiction in terms. We Jews of culture are obliged to resist the very idea. The first uh, instance of the expression Jew of culture in Reef's work was in Fellow Teachers. Uh, third volume in his trilogy that, that I mentioned earlier, entitled The Jew of Culture, uh, contains uh, a number of uh, articles uh, and chapters from previous works that uh, address uh, Reef's particular focus uh, uh, on what he came to call second culture, which, uh, which would be the culture that gave us uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, and others. In what uh, in Christian terms is called the Old Testament, but in Jewish terms, it's called the Hebrew Bible or Tanakh. Uh, look at number five. It is the deadly fault of the modern intelligentsia that it refuses to assert even the possibility of innocence. Here uh, was a, an effort on Reef's part to hold intellectuals responsible. And so it follows in the number six, uh, a famous, often quoted uh, statement, also from what I presume you've read in the Triumph of the Therapeutic, the favorite uh, of, of many who uh, are familiar with Reef's work, I too aspire to see clearly like a rifleman with one eye shut. I too aspire to think without assent. This is the ultimate violence to which the modern intellectual is committed. Since things have become as they are, I too share the modern desire not to be deceived. What's powerful to me about that uh, is something that Reef continually criticized uh, that the efforts to understand the world never cease because no one wants to be behind the times. No one wants to be deceived. Uh, and he used to all, often say that uh, when a social scientist would argue that we need to do more research, Reef would respond, we already have knowledge enough to know how to live. 
we don't need to do any more research. Of course, no one would listen to that because the engines of uh, scholarship and research require that there's a belief that more can be found out. That, uh, Alistair McIntyre, Uh, once pointed out that, uh, re and, and like to uh, refer to Reef's notion that writing more and more got you nowhere, and that uh, things like academic appointments and tenure should be based on not writing at all. But of course, this this is almost a facetious notion uh, given the, the, the structure of what he calls the modern desire not to be deceived. So you can already uh, see in six sentences that Reef had a complicated way of both acknowledging the world he lived in and at the same time formulating ways to be critical of it. I think you can go to the next page. Thank you, David. Um, my favorite, which I uh, rarely hesitate uh, to quote is number seven there on the top of the left. Contempt is the readiest emotion of one intellectual confronting another. I have tried my entire life, close to getting closer to 50 years in this business, to not live up to that particular adage, to that aphorism. I can be critical, but I know the difference between contempt and criticism. And so did Reef. Uh, but he was telling us something about uh, the way that modern intellectuals have come to position themselves. That's why I, I put the next one, number eight, uh, directly following. Experience is a swindle. The experience know that much. I'll just leave that with what it is. Then you see through nine and uh, 13, uh, a repetition from uh, different parts of his corpus uh, on what he called the therapy of therapies, uh, the therapy of all therapies. Number 12, violence is the therapy of therapies. Uh, there is less and less to inhibit the final therapy, least where the most progressively re-educated classes seem ready to go beyond that, their old hope of deliverance. From violence as the last desperate disciplinary means built into the interdicts as punishment to violence as a means toward a saving indiscipline as self-expression. Well, what could that possibly mean? It's, uh, the first occasion in these sentences where he introduces the notion of interdicts. But what I wanna say about it uh, first and foremost is that in fellow teachers, he has uh, a very illuminating observation that after the hippies come the thugs. And what he meant by that was that if there is not an established way in which character is formed and maintained, the tendency toward complete indiscipline and eventually violence will follow. And so he criticized youth culture of, at his time in the late 1960s and 70s, as I referred to earlier, uh, the student revolts in that period shook a lot of very gifted writers at the time, shook a lot of them up uh, pretty badly. But what are the interdicts? Well, he, he formulated, uh, and it really began 
in earnest in fellow teachers. Uh, the idea of interdicts, remissions, and transgressions. This was a tripartite theory of the formation of authority and culture. The interdicts were always in Reese terms, stipulations of what was not to be done. The remissions were an understanding of not only what was not to be done, yet done. And the question uh, that Reef always posed was that if they're done with no understanding of why they're wrong, that's a transgression. But there are times uh, in which the remissions permit things that the interdicts would prohibit universally. And I think that uh, his theory then established for him the way to think about what he came to call second culture, uh, the, the culture uh, defined by the Hebrew Bible and addressed in religious traditions in a variety of ways that form in their cultures. In many respects, uh, and I don't know how much uh, I can talk here about it or how familiar we are uh, with the sociologist Max Weber, who wrote the famous Protestant ethic in the spirit of capitalism. Uh, Reef tried to move beyond Weber's formulations of the evolution, in particular, of Protestant thought, and to argue that the religious traditions of the West, specifically, owed their understanding of the interdicts to, for instance, the Ten Commandments, that it's no surprise that an interdictory culture is going to have more thou shalt nots than thou shalt. And uh, in this way, I often ask students uh, how many of the commandments, if they're still familiar with them, uh, are interdicts and how many are positive encouragements. And they usually uh, come up with thou shalt not kill and the like. It's always a little harder to find the positive ones. Um, but as a, my own age with adult children, uh, honor thy father and thy mother is not an insignificant positive encouragement. Let's look at a couple more of these and then maybe I'll let you ask me some questions. Um, number 17, uh, or actually go, go to uh, 16, because here's another way in which he formulates uh, the change in personality and character uh, that he lamented uh, for most of his scholarly life. We are, I fear, getting to know one another. Reticence, secrecy, concealment of self have been transformed into, among other things, social problems. Once they were aspects of civility, when the great Western formulary summed up in the creedal phrase, know thyself, encouraged obedience to communal purposes rather than suspicion of them. So for Reef, uh, after second culture, comes third culture, which he claims is the same period in which we have the emergence of psychological men and women. And uh, this particular formulation uh, that I just quoted uh, reverses the expectations from obedience to suspicion. And that is the violence that Reef said 
the intellectual commits. It's the violence that is the suspicion, the doubting. Um, philosophical traditions have a, a, a great stake uh, in, in doubting. And uh, although Reef didn't spend a great deal of time assessing different philosophers, he was certainly aware uh, of the way in which philosophical discourse itself had become part of the same problem that he was trying to identify here in uh, sentence 16. Set, uh, sentence 17 is also interesting uh, from the standpoint of political theory. The combination of a repressive political order with a permissive moral order is not unheard of in human history. And uh, <laughs> I won't give any examples, uh, but leave it to your imagination about what he might have been thinking about. Um, number 21, uh, Reef's first law of private life reads, you only live once, comma, if then. When I wrote a remembrance of him in 2006, uh, that was the epigram I used at the beginning of my remembrance. Um, go the next page, Dave. You can see a sort of consistency here in number 26. There's a danger in laying oneself open to new ideas. As original disciples, the first consumers of new ideas develop inordinate desires to produce their own. Number 28, the piety of the therapeutic is historically more, most peculiar. It is a piety that shifts endlessly from object to object. What's hot? What's everybody talking about? Number 29, the faith of the rich has always been in themselves. Rendered democratic, this religion proposes that every man become his own eleemosynary institution. That's another word for charitable. Here is a redefinition of charity from which the inherited faith of Christianity may never recover. Out of this redefinition, Western culture is changing already into a symbol system unprecedented in its plasticity and absorptive capacity. Nothing much can oppose it really, and it welcomes all criticism, for in a sense, it stands for nothing. Here is Reef, I would uh, offer, uh, is the Reef that was uh, largely viewed by this point uh, as both pessimistic and conservative. But I think that's uh, really uh, a misunderstanding of what he was trying to argue was happening first at the top and then throughout the cultural and class system, particularly of the United States, but also in Europe. So that what we have here, the faith of the rich has always been in themselves, is an acknowledgement that the elites historically demanded obedience, but that by the time we see the emergence of psychological men and women, Reef argues, the elites stood for nothing. And even in our present politics today in the United States, there's a great deal uh, of hand-wringing uh, about who's standing for what and the suspicion is clearly greater than the obedience. Um, 
2032 uh, rather, as academics, and you can see just as that, as academics, uh, after 1973, he, uh, really after 1966, he was only talking uh, to those of us uh, who assume some responsibility in the, in the teaching cadres uh, of which he was a part. As academics, our vocation is to teach the intellect tried resistances in disciplines that refuse the easiest option of all, an imagination full of nothing but options. There again is the prophetic, but taken not as a prediction of the future, but as a reinstatement of something that came from the past. Though there's no way that he would have been inclined to support uh, or advocate a reinstatement of the past as it was. And I think that's, uh, I'll stop there for right now. Uh, I think that's really uh, one of the consistent ironies of, of uh, Reef's life, life work, which, the, which was that though he came to be regarded uh, very much as a cultural conservative, he never uh, camped with uh, most of the, what came to be uh, the right wing in, in academic circles. It's not a very big wing uh, to say the least. Uh, uh, he, he thought particularly in his last works, uh, of a very different kind of world uh, than the one uh, that some would have want to reinstitute even in this country. Um, and that had a great deal to do uh, with his own uh, personal background. I'll, I'll say one more thing. There was uh, Reef, I, I didn't mention anything about this. Uh, Reef, was teaching at the University of Chicago as a graduate student. And he met uh, Susan Sontag, who I would presume most of you are, have heard of and are familiar with. They courted for less than 10 days and were married. Uh, and when Reef uh, got his uh, first job in the early 1950s at Brandeis University, uh, they moved together to Cambridge, Massachusetts. And they had one son who I've met several, more than several times, David Reef. Um, and he, uh, he and Sontag uh, lived in Cambridge uh, until they separated and were eventually divorced. And that's a whole nother story. But there's a huge uh, recent biography of Susan Sontag written by someone uh, who claimed if you read the reviews of the book, one of the, the, the standout um, claims in the book is that Reef didn't write the mind of the moralist, Susan Sontag did. And I can say with some <laughs> great confidences, that's absurd. Uh, and it can be established in a, a number of ways. And of course was based on spite and vitriol that Moser, the biographer, seemed to want to uh, repeat and escalate. And it's very unfortunate. But what is, is important to understand is that it was that uh, near calamity in his uh, life uh, that led him to have much less to do as a public presence 
in contrast to Susan Sontag, whose public presence became larger and larger, uh, certainly out of the 60s and, and, and beyond. Uh, and I noted in my remembrance that uh, he never quite, I think she got over him, but he never quite got over her. He married again in the early 1960s uh, to uh, a philosopher named Allison Douglas Knox, and they were married for uh, close to four decades. Um, but when he was finishing uh, his magnum opus, at one point, uh, he had dedicated one of the volumes to the second commandment and then changed it to her. So there was uh, an underlying stream of complicated personal, what we now call narrative. Uh, and it has to be part of the reckoning of who Philip Reef was both personally and intellectually. So I'll stop there and uh, hope that there might be some questions or observations uh, of any sort. I'm, I'm happy to field whatever people want, want to say. Well, yeah, certainly. Um, I think that's a wonderful summation of Philip Reef's life and work. Uh, if anybody has anything, I think there are a number of questions here in the chat room and a number of people can raise their hands if anybody has anything and I'll put you on talk if you would like. I think James, James has a question here. Oh, yes. Uh, I wanted to asked you if, uh, if he, uh, in, in one sense, is he a, a Freudian? Is, uh, he's definitely not a um, believer in the pleasure principle, right? <laughs> uh, well, uh, not, not, yeah, not really. So is he, because uh, I was listening to the video and it was called the, uh, uh, has to do with the word faith. What was his faith in? His faith was in the the uh, the Christian uh, tradition or Christian um, classical tradition. I would I, I would put it another way. He he, uh, he he was Jewish. He was not a religious Jew. Oh, okay. But but he was uh, clearly thought that the Jewish tradition had brought and been responsible for what he described as the creation of the second culture. The first culture was pagan. The second culture was uh, religious. And uh, he was far more ambivalent uh, about Christianity than is sometimes uh, noticed in his work. The ambivalence had to do uh, with holding the Jews responsible, for instance, for the death of Christ. And if he were alive today and could envision the anti-Semitism, the Jew hatred that has emerged both from the left and the right, no, no one uh, in the higher intellectual precincts would uh, argue that uh, Jew hatred is not on the right, on the far right they are more ambivalent about saying that it's on the, on the left and the far left, it clearly is. And uh, Reef, uh, I think, uh, would have agreed with that in Stanter. Uh, as for Freud, <laughs> Freud, Freud was for him an intellectual project. He saw Freud as the creator of immense suspicions about religion, about uh, Moses, uh, about uh, in Freud's The Future of an Illusion. 
Reef saw in that the architecture of suspicion. And as I was talking earlier, I don't think that he, uh, he uh, Reef imagined that he could be a, a, a leader like Moses uh, taking his people through the wilderness. He, he knew that was not possible, which is why I think in part, there is no real school uh, uh, of Reef. There are a number of uh, people that I know, some know very well and have known for a very long time. Uh, a fabulous recent book uh, by a retired sociologist, Howard Kay, on Freud's social theory uh, that Rutledge published. I highly recommend it. Uh, it it's a step beyond uh, Reef's own, own work on Freud. But at the same time, I think that uh, Reef wanted us to understand the importance of Freud without necessarily being an advocate of Freud. That is often the way in which he came uh, at cultural change itself. Thank you. All right, uh, let's try for uh, David S. Your turn. Hi, uh, can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Uh, sort of two questions then, just for some clarity. One is on the text, uh, just the, the text we were assigned just before it says chapter eight, which is uh, page, the bottom of 23. So I'm looking a, a little above that. The paragraph before that, and then the ending of the paragraph above, it's, it's talking about uh, God terms and, you know, this distinction between talking about God and men. After all, it says one does not really choose, one is chosen. I'm trying to understand what he gets at in the rest of that paragraph. Uh, if you jump to the last sentence, I can assume what he means, but he gets there in such a convoluted way for me. I don't quite get <laughs> I can't parse it. It says, if you found that paragraph just at the end, near the end of page 23 uh, of our PDF, I'll read it. This is one way of stating the difference between gods and men. Gods choose, men are chosen. All right. What men lose when they become free as gods is precisely that sense of being chosen which encourages them in their gratitude to take their subsequent choices seriously. Well, I'm, I'm really lost in that. Put it another way, this means freedom does not exist without responsibility. Well, I know what that conclusion is he, that he's saying, but I don't see how he said anything that remotely takes us. Can you help parse that somehow with using his language or, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Um... It's direction by indirection. I mean, I, mean, I think that uh, the prototype for this uh, is, uh, for instance, uh, the Akeda story in uh, Abraham uh, is told by God to bring Isaac to the mountain and to sacrifice him. And he doesn't, obviously. And... Uh, the, the rest uh, is, is a story uh, of the nature of obedience and chosenness. And uh, there's been a lot uh, historically made of, for instance, Jews referring, being referred to as the chosen people. What, what, what Reef was doing, I think, in those uh, sentences uh, was reenacting it uh, as it were, on a, more on an everyday level, that uh, if we don't understand what we're responsible for, but we only are given an endless array of options to choose from, then we can't be responsible. And how that uh, plays out uh, in each individual life uh, is probably best represented by an understanding of whether one has made 
the right or wrong choice. And I think that uh, it's not uh, it's not a philosophical problem; it's a moral problem. And uh, Reef uh, speaks in in that way. It it it. it there is no question if you have a, a chance to read fellow teachers uh, that there will be moments where you are um, lost. Mm -hmm. But, but I, th I think that uh, that goes with uh, Reef's own understanding of the nature of responsibility. It is being, being uh, able to know what the right choices are. Um, okay, so I can read this however I like because I want to choose a certain way to understand it, but uh, I don't have the faith that I am with him in what he meant by it because it seems to see use the words exactly opposite from the way I would have said them. Yeah. That you know, right, men uh, are being chosen, but they have to see themselves as choosing. And if they see themselves as choosing, then they're as free as gods. But we shouldn't see ourselves as free as gods because our consequences matter. So is, does he know he's writing in a way that's really obfuscating? I'd like to ask him. Um, <laughs> I, I, th I think that uh, what you've just uh, read from there, what you've just described, uh, is perfectly Reefian in the sense <laughs> that, in the sense that what he's uh, playing with is is the idea uh, that first emerges uh, in the mind of the moralist uh, that we become our own eleemosynary institutions uh, that the most important thing is to attend to what we want rather than what is expected of us uh, that explains uh, the responsibility of parents that explains the responsibility of teachers. That explains the responsibilities of professionals. We know all those things, uh, but yet again and again, we see those who are unable to fulfill those responsibilities. Uh, all right, so, so um, I guess my second question is um, about the, my dilemma in reading his uh, description, well, or his entire work in terms of the fact he's using the word morality throughout. And yet you're talking about a way of saying, well, we'll know what's moral, we know. And if we're looking at the Freudian sense, it's just a matter of the superego imposing on us, which was externally determined. and. Is that all he's talking about? Or is he talking about something else, which is more universal? And, you know, yet I get the feeling he's denying there's anything more universal than that in therapeutic man, because you're finding something about yourself out and it's determined by yourself. How does, in that sense, does something outside of you become objective, necessary, required, obligatory? He wants to avoid obligation and just rationally determine something as uh, it works for me. Uh, it seems, uh, or is he just describing what he sees in Freud? You know, where does the community matter if I don't care about the community? There's the, the community is just going to impose obligations on it. I, this I find this. Where what kind of morality are we talking about? If that those are the conclusions here, you know, it's not. It's not. Um, uh, uh, what a philosophical morality. It's, it's a sociological examination of Freudian morality that would arise from his analytic therapeutic man. Leaves out the values, you know. I, th I, I don't think that there's anything you're saying that uh, necessarily contradicts what he's trying to mm. convey, which, which is that historically a culture had specific kinds of stipulations that demanded obedience, that demanded a response of a certain sort. Not all mm -hmm. cultures are the same. Uh, what Reef's concern was, particularly as his, 
his intellectual approaches evolved was that he was witnessing what he thought was the end of culture itself, of a disciplinary and disciplining uh, set of formations that would create expectations, including uh, feelings of guilt. Uh, all of the all of these um, feelings uh, in the in the, that began with uh, with Freud's investigation uh, mm -hmm. needed to be tossed away, so that we see more and more behavior and beliefs that have no stipulations in what Reef would have called and did call second culture. So if we're going to find obligations and they're not going to be imposed by external cultural norms, it's going to be therapeutically determined. It's, it's going to be uh, something, sorry, go ahead. Can they just be anything? There's no, there's no direction in this. He's not willing to commit that actually there are right and wrong things. Yes. I think he would have said the same thing. <laughs> there are right and wrong things. Oh, he would have said that. Okay, I wasn't sure that he would. Okay. Oh, ab absolutely. In fact, uh, the reason I mentioned that uh, he might be classified more today as a cultural conservative is because the right and wrong things uh, that he felt strongly about are not necessarily the right and wrong things that uh, a much larger uh, segment of uh, the population think that. Uh, okay, my last question. So where would these right and wrongs be coming from? They, they, they come from the traditions of obedience that were the responsibility of the elites that Reef said had given up being true elites. Sounds very culturally derived and historically determined as opposed to objective and universal, you know, you're saying. Well, the, uh, I think one of the first sentences that uh, maybe sentence two, uh, I read about uh, the universal culture is an absurd notion. And, and he then refers to every Jew of culture knows that. See the the, the the Jew of culture isn't a Jew <laughs> in the in the uh, ethnic or religious sense per se. In Reef, the Jew of culture is that uh, uh, defining of uh, o obedience to the traditions that uh, emerge from second culture. That mm -hmm. is the the culture that brought us. The, he the Hebrew Bible, what Christians call the Old Testament. Okay. And I, I, you know, I mentioned that we read, uh, this would have been maybe 1975, we for a year, we read Paul's letter to the Romans. When you read texts like, like that, this, now, now I'm talking uh, 45 years ago, you never forget I mean, I think I know it by heart, but what I always re uh, refer to when I think of Paul's letter to the Romans is chapter three, line eight. Do you know what that is? I don't know that one. Nope. No, I, I don't know that one, no. So, does anybody know? <laughs> nope. I think I think if Reef were here, he would already say, "You see, <laughs> let us do evil that good may come." That Paul was asked the antinomian question. He was talking to the Romans, and they said, "If if it's a good cause, why can't I do something that's wrong in order to achieve it?" And what was Paul's response? whose damnation is just. So Reef, Reef uh, would have read that, we read that uh, chapter three, line eight, in a way that opened up all kinds of things to look at. For instance, 
Marxist revolution. What kind of revolution is that? Stalin had to kill a lot of people in order to not even achieve what he wanted. It's not clear what he wanted. But these are observations I make uh, that haven't just been handed down to me by reef. It's uh, part of the way in which we would come at understanding uh, the nature of history and what, what has happened, for instance, in the past hundred years. If you were to ask me for an assessment of the present moment, it's an extraordinary moment, isn't it? With disease, with a tremendous upsurge in racial concerns. And all on top of that is the recognition that there's a tremendous amount of disagreement bursting in violence. And it's something that I think should be making us all think about what uh, we make of the past and what we support and don't support. I don't support violence. That's a pretty easy one. But I'm not a pacifist. <laughs> Any great thinker or writer has such wonderful richness that you can spend a lot of time d discussing and debating. Thanks, David. Uh, let's go with uh, Eugene. Hi, Gene. Hi. Um, so just a brief question about um, his uh, cultural conservatism. Um, so I haven't read Fellow Teachers, but um, I have heard um, Alan Bloom's Closing the American Mind, right? Which, as you probably know, is an extremely successful book in his time uh, sure. compared to Fellow Teachers. Um, so was um, Reef familiar with, uh, did he read Closing the American Mind? And if so, what did he think about the argument and its success? You know, I, I don't think I ever had any real conversation with him about it. Uh, I did have conversations with him about uh, Christopher Lash, who, who I mentioned earlier, who I, th I think he genuinely admired uh, a kind of, as we thought as a popularizer of his own ideas. I think, th I think that uh, Bloom was in some ways also a popularizer of uh, some of Reef's ideas. In, in particular, they all had a problem with rock music. I, I don't have as much of a problem with that. Uh, it was as if that kind of music uh, represented a, a, an affront to uh, certain cultural sensibilities. And, and um, I know that Reef, for instance, didn't like Dylan. And I always, uh, I, I tell my students now the story that uh, when I drove my uh, youngest uh, to school, uh, he rediscovered for me uh, the early Dylan up until about 65, 1965. And that we listened to it in the car uh, and that I really grew to like it because I didn't like it in the 1960s. Funny about that. Um, I hear he has a great new album too, but that's for another session. Um, I, I think that Al, Alan Bloom is uh, regarded among intellectuals uh, as having hit the jackpot. Uh, a, a, a coffee table book, as it was called. Uh, I think Reef knew that fellow teachers would never be a coffee table book. Um, I think that uh, Alan Bloom struck a chord at a particular moment 
that engaged a national conversation. Think about it though, if we were to read it today, how it would resonate or what, whether it would resonate at all. Um, I'm waiting for that book again. Uh, it, I'm sure it's on the way, kind of COVID, racial injustice, somebody bringing it all together. I'm sorry, I can't be more helpful on that. Hi, this is, I know I'm coming with Michael's account. This is my boyfriend's account. I'm using his account. Um, so reading the, the reading, uh, the parts that I read, um, I was um, kind of uh, conflicted, especially right now with the current situation that we have. Um, and I thought that the, the, the writer was, was very much addressing what, what I feel about the society right now, that like, I feel like secular individualism uh, that works in a non-crisis situation, um, it's kind of um, become a, become a issue, become issue um, with compare, comparing to uh, what he called like cultural discipline that, that uh, the religion brings uh, to the society. Um, and I didn't feel that, that at least, and honestly, I didn't read the whole, I couldn't read the whole thing, but I didn't feel that there is a solution for it. Um, cause, cause I feel it right now, like as a person who's, who's a skeptic and goes to a very, very good therapist. I feel that he, he can't find a solution for me anymore. And he, he, it's just like there's something that it's not, it's hard to find a solution for it in a, in a secular, individualistic um, um, mindset, or, or I can say package of, package of thought. But like maybe, maybe that disciplined uh, ideologies or packages of uh, belief can somehow lower the anxiety of their followers or believers in situations like this um, and even guide them uh, through to lower their anxiety. Um, and uh, I just wanted to know about your opinion because I feel like at the end of the day, majority of people are, are easier to be directed with like packages of beliefs because they're simple. They're simple disciplines that the masses can follow and have, a, have some sort of order, uh, especially in terms of morality. You know, that I feel that guilt works, works for masses of people because it stops them because we cannot expect the, the masses to read psychology, read philosophy, and follow secular ideas or secular ethics or morality. Um, and that, that's what I feel like. Um, and I feel like, I feel like this was addressed by him early, very early on, even before you see that in a society the way we see it these days. Um, and um, I wanted to hear about your opinion um, uh, because you're, you're familiar with his belief and his, his, his writing um, uh, on what he would say about the dilemma right now that we have in society um, at this point. And thank you so much. And thanks David for, for this suggestion. It was great reading. Thank you. Thank you. I, it, it's, a, it's a big question. I, I did want to uh, clarify that uh, 
Um, I'm not against therapy <laughs> by any measure. I, I think that the designation therapeutic culture is intended uh, to help us make sense uh, of certain inevitable tensions, certain inevitable conflicts uh, that define uh, particular moments in time. And what I mean by that is that there, there have to be occasions or incidents uh, that require us to have some opinion, some response, some approval, some disapproval. Uh, what Reef called the vertical in authority was a way uh, of pointing out that you're never free from judgment. You're always making judgments of one kind or another. And how you make those judgments have a great deal to do with what you've been taught and what has been expected of you. So that, um, the therapist may have, uh, in, uh, for many people, an important role for helping to clarify how one is thinking about such matters. Uh, what's significant, I think, uh, in the therapeutic culture that Reef uh, described and tried to understand is that a great deal of the therapeutic encounter was intended not to be judgmental, but to help you be judgmental so that whatever choice you made reduced anxiety, reduced fear. Uh, so uh, the, the neurotic uh, is the modal type. We're all neurotic in one way or another. Uh, Freud just described some of those types of neuroses, uh, fear of spiders, um, obsession with particular kinds of objects. All, all of these things, uh, psychoanalysis brought to a broader cultural frame uh, in which people then began uh, to see themselves. Oh, that's me, they described uh, as described uh, by the psychiatrist or the clinical psychologist. Um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a way of helping people manage in a world where their commitments have less communal institutional relations. And Individuality is something that uh, is difficult to maintain. So we we're we're living in a uh, in a moment where we can be together like this and in effect, not really together at all. Uh, I, th I think that it's uh, incumbent upon uh, all of us uh, to keep reading if we're uh, scholars of one kind or another to keep writing. Uh, one of the things I've uh, worked on uh, for a number of years uh, back in 2014, I think, in a, a journal called The American Interest, I, I wrote an uh, article on the idea of meritocracy, which has been getting a lot more attention in the past several years. And uh, what's always interested me about meritocracy is, again, what Reef would have called the problem of elites for what kind of uh, social order has been created by a large investment and belief in meritocracy that if you work hard and 
uh, you uh, have the talent and the ability, uh, you get ahead or you get into Harvard, uh, take your choice. Uh, the, point, the point is uh, that meritocracy itself has uh, come under a great deal of scrutiny. Uh, most people don't know even where the term came from. It was invented in the same way that the term sociology was invented. Uh, August Comte in the 19th century coined the term sociology because a French statistician named Quetelet uh, stole uh, Comte's first idea, name, namely wanting to call this field social physics. We're lucky it didn't get called that. Um, meritocracy was coined uh, in the 1950s based on a book by a British sociologist named Michael Young called The Rise of Meritocracy. If you haven't read it, you should read it. It's, it's, a, it's, it's what Isaac Asimov and the sociologist Daniel Bell both called social science fiction. I love that expression. Um, it's, it's an imaginary novel uh, about the creation of a society. England is what Jung had in mind that moves from aristocracy to meritocracy. As if the move wouldn't create its own set of problems, as I think we have now, particularly in a moment of, of in America and apparently around the world, a substantial concern about racial injustice, uh, meritocracy is going to come under a much greater uh, scrutiny. Uh, Thank you so much. Okay, that's great. I think I was on mute the last time, so I think uh, I'll have to remember. I think we got Alex up next. Alex, are you there? Great, thanks, David. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Um, thanks, Professor uh, Emma, for your uh, talk. Um, I have a couple of questions um, related uh, related to one another. The first one is about the Frankfurt School. Uh, so, as you were talking, um, it struck me that um, I guess a part of uh, Philip Reef's critis cultural criticism is strike some similar notes to, let's say, somebody like uh, Marcuse, um, especially this idea that you mentioned of um, a society that can be repressive uh, and totalitarian in many ways, and yet highly permissive when it comes to the realm of desire and consumption and so on. And uh, so I was wondering if you could say a little bit about uh, Philip Reeves' connection, maybe contrast also with the Frankfurt School uh, because, of course, they do come from a Marxist kind of materialist uh, and, and the left, you know, uh, the left side. And um, the second question is about uh, the future. Um, so in, in the Frankfurt School, for example, you know, there is a kind of messianic idea that sometimes gets brought up. Um, I'm wondering if there is something like that in Philip Reeves' uh, outlook as well. You know, uh, so you described him as a prophetic thinker, but in the sense that he's looking to the past. Uh, what would he say about the future, though? I wonder. Would he? Um, uh, is there maybe a kind of the possibility of a messianic uh, coming of a sacred order, or something like that? Uh, looking, so in a sense, looking beyond this third world or third culture uh, that he diagnoses. Thank you very much. Uh, I should begin by saying that uh, when Reef and Sontag were married and lived in Cambridge, they were very good friends with Herbert Marcuse, who was uh, at Brandeis at the time. Uh, and their differences were, I think, uh, intellectual differences that had yet uh, to be associated with uh, as in Marcuse's case, uh, with uh, emerging uh, social movements. So um, certainly Reef uh, 
uh, would have parted intellectual company with Marcuse uh, on Marcuse's idea uh, that the future of the working classes uh, was not sustainable, certainly not in America, a, a, a political future for them. Um, and instead, uh, Marcuse uh, turned to the young uh, minorities, women, and saw those as the emerging movements. And he was absolutely right. Uh, we're I think we're still in uh, Marcusean territory uh, at, even at the present moment in that regard. Um, Reef, uh, I think that Reef uh, wasn't as impressed by uh, figures like uh, Adorno or Horkheimer or uh, Walter Benjamin. Uh, I've, I've been much more impressed uh, over the years uh, not so much uh, the Marxist side, uh, because I, I think they all uh, recognized uh, that what was ever moving societies in whatever directions they were going, uh, that the liberation movements uh, were not necessarily going uh, that is that the liberation movements were necessarily going to be more important uh, than the movements that Marx uh, uh, supported. And in fact, you know, in uh, Reef said once uh, in a seminar, I think it was a job talk at the University of Pennsylvania, that the first line of the Communist Manifesto the history of all hitherto existing societies is the history of class struggles, was either the most profound statement uh, ever written or the most paranoid. Uh, some of my students get that, uh, a lot don't. But what I get uh, from that observation that Reef made uh, is that all these movements, these mass movements, uh, have a certain element of paranoia to them uh, that is read psychoanalytically. Uh, who wakes up in the morning and thinks of the class revolution anymore? No, they wake up in the morning uh, with a variety of identity politics that, that animate for them their purpose. Uh, and any challenge to that identity uh, creates a, what psychoanalytically would be uh, considered a certain uh, type of paranoia. That said, I think that the only place I know uh, where Reef tried uh, to develop a sustained idea of a culture beyond third culture, he called it fourth culture and it's in in this book, uh, The Crisis of the Officer Class, the second volume in the trilogy, the very last chapter, the last words uh, are on his imagining a fourth culture. Uh, but I don't think, uh, it, it. I have to say that of all the things that I've read by him and I've read most everything uh, over the years, uh, it strikes me as uh, particularly incoherent, um, a kind of almost playing with words and ideas uh, that he'd just run out of steam. That's why I, I kind of like to insist that if he's prophetic in any way, it was toward a restoration of some elements of the past, not the past uh, per se, but uh, certain elements within it and a recognition, and I think he was right in this regard, that there always will be uh, among human beings uh, some capacity to make judgments. 
I'm just trying to think about anything else related to the Frankfurt School. Um, there have been arguments among sociologists about uh, the particular value of the Frankfurt School. And uh, I, I entirely agree that uh, it, it derived a great deal of its intellectual energy uh, on the left. But <laughs> even Adorno, when he, he, you know, he, he lived in Los Angeles during the war, and when he went back to Germany, he, he, he suddenly uh, was labeled by the younger generation uh, as too conservative for them. Um, now we, it, you know, it's interesting to me as a sociologist is now we don't really see th this younger generation uh, talking about people being conservative or liberal or, or even radical, they're talking about them as uh, candidates for being canceled, uh, as if to say that person did something and I'm not excusing in any way what they may have done, but they did something and it was based on their actions that we say they should lose their jobs. It's based on the words they speak that we say they should lose their jobs. Um, that seems to me to be far more dangerous uh, than any uh, movement uh, that the Frankfurt School uh, or Marcuse in particular uh, was endorsing. And where it comes from is a kind of uh, censuring dynamic uh, that has only grown in its ferocity. And I, I, I don't know if there's a tipping point for it where there'll be a, a reaction back against it in some way. But a lot of people have uh, argued, and I think rightly again, uh, that's for instance, the Me Too movement has opened up a great deal of uh, exposure and insight uh, in particular to the way that uh, men have behaved toward women. I've taught at a women's college uh, for close for uh, 40 years. Uh, so this kind of movement uh, doesn't surprise me uh, in, in the end. I've, I've heard the voices within for uh, many decades uh, about these issues. Uh, I think the latest uh, issues with racial injustice, uh, I, I, I think it's a, a long time coming. Uh, and I think a lot of people have uh, woken up, but I don't think you have to be woke to be woken up in, in, in particular in that regard. Um, now I may be speaking in vocabulary that's not familiar to people, so I'll stop there. That's great. Okay. Uh, thanks, Alex. Let's, uh, I think actually you might have answered Anne's question, but I'll uh, get to Anne now. Yeah, yeah, actually you just did because I was going to ask about, you know, if therapeutic is the third uh, culture, what might be the fourth? But I guess also I had the thought while you were explaining could Reef have contemplated a multicultural environment? In other words, you don't have one monomodal culture, which I don't think we do anymore, um, where you have, you know, we have, what, 7.6 billion people on Earth today. There is no we um, in the sense of, you know, the mosaic, uh, the mosaic framework uh, of ancient Israel. So how, how do you think, in other words, that we would have people who are still first, what he called first culture. Other people would be second culture. Other people would be third, fourth, fifth, et cetera. Thanks, and it was a great presentation, appreciate it. Thanks, David. Well, I, I think that what uh, you're pointing to there uh, is, is something that uh, has only become plainer to us 
uh, in an era of what we now call globalization. Uh, it's a mixture of technology uh, and culture where really uh, on the right of center, uh, it's been described as a class of a clash of civilizations. And on the left of center, uh, it's more uh, about the emergence of multiculturalism. Uh, 30 years ago at Wellesley, or maybe even a little longer than that, 35 years ago, the college introduced a multicultural requirement, uh, which was that at least originally, there would be designated courses in different academic departments that students could take to fulfill the requirement. It was like a one course requirement. Um, I was against it at the time, lar largely because uh, I thought it would be uh, too easy just to take a course about yourself, <laughs> about your own culture. Uh, how, 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 do you, how would you define as an individual what your culture is? Um, I thought it would have been called much neater to have called it a Weltanschauung requirement, uh, a worldview requirement, as uh, the German translation. And what that would entail uh, might, might be a course uh, in religion or philosophy. In other words, so something that would broaden uh, a liberal arts education. Of course, there was a political motive associated with it then that now seems almost like an ancient relic uh, because of course uh, the requirement was eventually watered down to you needed to take a course to, of a, on a culture other than your own. Um, at Wellesley uh, that has a fairly large contingent of international students uh, that would mean perhaps taking a course in constitutional democracy. You know, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know how it's actually empirically played out, uh, but I think you're right uh, about multiculturalism, uh, that it, uh, it's a much more resonant phenomenon uh, than its kind of early political manifestations uh, suggested uh, to those who might have been opposed to it on that basis. Um, I remember Reef once saying that multiculturalism is a monism. And what he meant by that was that uh, it was in, in intended to direct people to certain political ideas at, at, in contrast to others. But I, 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 do, th I do think that with globalization, uh, there's been a much uh, clearer sense uh, of the multi-dimensional nature uh, of cultures throughout the world. But I think one thing that Reef uh, might have said if he were alive today about globalization, what I would say, uh, is that uh, it has um, clearly uh, created uh, a, a much greater correspondence among different societies that can be in touch with each other and uh, is actually a challenge in ways that probably hadn't been predicted before to authoritarian governments. So uh, the very existence uh, uh, of something like Zoom or any uh, Facebook or any of the social media platforms uh, creates the possibility for communications that uh, are harder to intercept and control by governments. In fact, the, uh, one of my uh, uh, friends and colleagues at another university many years ago pointed out that the uh, fall uh, of the Soviet Union really uh, was brought about uh, by the fax machine, that people were able uh, to communicate with each other uh, unbeknownst 
uh, to the uh, the groups. Uh, I was thinking of East Germany's uh, Stasi and uh, and Russia. That those organizations uh, couldn't completely control who was communicating with whom. It's even more powerful today, despite the efforts, uh, say in China, of trying to close down those networks. And apparently, I think I read today that our Secretary of State uh, wants to close down uh, Chinese creative platforms. That's a whole. That's those are the cyber wars. Uh, that's a whole different level uh, of uh, possibilities for connections and agitation that kind of render even the idea of multiculturalism uh, as a, uh, another antique artifact of uh, historical communication. <laughs> Thank you. I also think the, uh... Well, it's not so recent anymore, about seven years ago. The Arabs, Arab Spring yes. was uh, very, very much uh, driven by social media, cell phones, Twitter. Yes, I forgot cell phones. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, once you have the technology, you can change uh, how communication happens between the citizens, and that's going to change the political arrangement. So, yeah. Well, I think there was a uh, one uh, person who had a, a hand up, but I think the question was uh, if Philip Reef knew Roger Scruton at all. I don't think so. Um, I th here, here, here again, I'll say um, there was a a time when Reef was looking for a publisher for the, his uh, trilogy of the Sacred Order, of the Social or, Sacred Order, Social Order um, volumes. And uh, I knew uh, some people at uh, ISI, which is a, a Russell Kirk created conservative uh, publisher and think tank of sorts. Uh, and uh, Reef's immediate reaction was, no, I don't want to be associated with them. Uh, even though uh, many that I know in sociology that know of Phil Reef think that he was, you know, right of Attila. The, uh, most of them had no idea who's right of Attila the Hun. Uh, and Reef certainly was not. But his allergy uh, to the kind of traditional, uh, nearly paleo conservatives uh, was that he, did, he didn't want to be associated with them. Eventually, um, he was. <laughs> when uh, the Triumph of the Therapeutic was reissued, it, was, uh, it, it got licensed from the University of Chicago to publish for five years under the imprint of uh, ISI. Um, but that, you know, that's old history. I, 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 th I think that uh, the fact of the matter is, is that uh, he was not really interested in being part of the, uh, the political debates. Uh, that's, that's probably why uh, he, he's more obscure at present than even if, even figures like uh, Christopher Lash and Alan Bloom. Um, there have there haven't been many what I would call conventional conservatives in sociology, and that that's perfectly understandable uh, given its own history and uh, the fact that. Uh, Many sociologists uh, see themselves as pursuing research that has some uh, liberating means uh, associated uh, with the findings. I don't mean they make them up, but I mean uh, 
uh, they would be concerned about uh, a, a certain range of issues uh, that had a much higher uh, sense of uh, b being unjust in some form or another. Um, it's, uh, it's important to remember that Reef got uh, a PhD in political science from the University of Chicago and never had an appointment in political science. It was, always, it was in sociology, first at Brandeis uh, and then at the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, as I said, he was uh, friends and colleagues with Herbert Marcuse. When he went to Penn, he became friends and colleagues uh, with Irving Goffman. If you know anything about Irving Goffman, uh, who's famous for having written a book called Stigma. Uh, his first book was called The Presentation of Self in Everyday Life. Goffman was a virtuoso in describing social life and social interaction. Um, they exchanged friendly barbs to each other. In my remembrance, I, I tell the story that Reef told more than once, uh, which is probably why I remembered it, that one day uh, he was walking in Philadelphia on um, one of the streets, Delancey Place, perhaps. He was uh, in his traditional uh, haberdashery of a three-piece suit with a gold watch on the vest, uh, a bowler cap in uh, very hot weather in the summer. And along came Irving Goffman, uh, who, who was in a convertible with a very uh, young uh, woman uh, in the passenger seat and who was wearing flip-flops and driving his car. And he stops and he sees Philip Reef and he says, uh, Philip, you must be suffocating in that outfit. And Reef looked at him and looked at this young lady and spoke directly to her and said, Pro Professor Goffman is a rich man who dresses like a poor man. I am a poor man who dresses like a rich man. That to me was emblematic. Uh, they probably couldn't be in any way theoretically uh, further apart on, on many ways of thinking, but there was enough room for both of them. And uh, to me, uh, what I, after uh, 40 or so years in this business, what I uh, regret most is how much smaller that space feels like it's become, that there's not enough room uh, for a very different range of opinions and views uh, without for some, the danger of, of, as I said earlier, of what now is being called being canceled. Okay, I think we have one question to Daniel. Go ahead. Yeah, Professor, thanks for your great scholarship on this important philosopher. Uh, just real quick to uh, earlier you talked about uh, the dedication of one of Reef's books being changed uh, from the second commandment to his wife. And uh, was that his magnum opus book? Or just if you could clarify what was the title uh, of that book you were referring to and, and why he changed it, maybe. <laughs> second commandment being the no graven images, of course. Commandment. It's the first volume I am of this, uh, uh, Sacred Order, Social Order, My Life Among the Death Works. Let's see if I can, and there it is, Susan Ton Sontag in Remembrance. It was originally supposed to be, I, I have uh, galley proofs. Uh, it was supposed to be the second commandment, but he changed it. And as I said earlier, and I wrote in my remembrance, he, he changed it because uh, he, he, he still in his own way loved her. And uh, perhaps that was uh, his own own way of reconciling 
filing, something that uh, in some ways stalked him his whole his whole life. Um, I would uh, I, I was saying uh, in relation to this earlier that a lot of sociologists who knew Reef in his generation didn't think he was a sociologist. It was one of the things that Reef uh, often laughed about when a, a, a well-known sociologist from California came through and uh, had known Reef at Chicago or someplace else and uh, would ask him about what Reef's work was at that moment in time and Reef would describe something or other and the, the, the fellow sociologist would say to him, but Philip, is, is that sociology? And he's, he would say, hey, that was one of the great compliments that he would receive from his <laughs> fellow sociologists. Um, I was asked to comment on a um, statement by a now uh, deceased sociologist named Neil Smelzer, uh, who knew Reef uh, when Reef spent a year or so out in at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, and really wrote a, a, a piece that was filled with what I, I can only describe as a remarkable animus. Uh, and I, I responded to it, I guess, with my own animus. Uh, but it was just another occasion uh, where there was a tremendous suspicion about uh, Reef's approach uh, to thinking uh, sociologically. Uh, it, it's clear to me that that's the way he was thinking. Um, it wasn't philosophically, it wasn't theologically, it wasn't psychologically, uh, it wasn't uh, uh, in terms of, of politics. For him, uh, politics uh, meant who was in and who was out, and that was about it. No, the, the, the whole way in which he came at, at thinking about society was first through the lens of culture and uh, the authority of culture. And as I pointed out earlier, the aesthetics of culture. Uh, it runs through his work. He, he was a great art collector. He had uh, 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 quite a collection in a, in a one of where he lived in uh, Center City, Philadelphia. I think I answered a question. I'm not <laughs> at, at, at this point, I usually uh, yeah. have a break or class ends. Well, sure, sure. Well, no, we're well, we're right at the uh, the two hour mark. I think this was. Uh, a wonderful, wonderful session. Uh, Philip Reef is offering a challenge to society as we've constructed it, and certainly, it's it's these are challenges that have yet to be addressed adequately. And his intellect was powerful and uncompromising. And I certainly would urge everybody to pursue him. Certainly go to the text, go to the books, uh, Triumph of the Therapeutic. Uh, uh, spend some time with this powerful thinker. You will not uh, find that time to be uh, misused. <laughs> I urge everyone to, uh, to, to read Philip Reef and, and consider him and debate him. Uh, I've certainly learned quite a bit from uh, pursuing him. And uh, this was a wonderful, wonderful presentation, uh, Jonathan. I want to thank you uh, by all means. This is this is uh, all, as enlightening and and I hope instructive to the members that uh, as I could have hoped. I'm I'm a reef evangelist and uh, always always happy to uh, talk about him, both uh, in what I remember him as a person. Uh, there, I would say, in closing, that there are others uh, who are much more adequately prepared uh, to talk about his theory than I am. And in fact, this book, which I edited uh, a year or two ago, uh, The Anthem 
companion to Philip Reef, published by a, a British publisher, Anthem, uh, has uh, about 11 chapters uh, by people who are well versed uh, in uh, Reef's work. And I, if, if you want to see what the latest is, uh, it's probably the last thing I, I'll do on Reef. Uh, I do have uh, an interest in someday seeing his lectures published because I think they are extraordinarily more accessible than the trilogy I was referring to. Uh, and I say that because he had to speak to people. When you write, you're not speaking to anyone. You're, you're in your own mind, which is fine for most, most of us. Um, but when you have to speak before an audience, uh, it, it, it is, as Samuel Johnson put it, uh, a kind of moment of hanging and uh, it clarifies the mind. Uh, and, and so the lectures that I have uh, in my possession, and I know that there are a number of others I've sent them to over the years, uh, they, they really belong uh, in print. The lecture in Australia is worthwhile too because you really get a flavor not only of uh, his way of thinking, uh, but his kind of humor and his uh, actually what I would describe as a certain gentle mindedness. Uh, that may be hard for some uh, people to believe, but most of those people who wouldn't believe it probably haven't read a word. They just have heard of him by reputation. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Jonathan. This was a wonderful, wonderful session. I can't thank you enough. And uh, I hope uh, many people will come to our next one. I think it's on the 13th next week. We'll be, uh, it won't be a presentation. It'll be a discussion on uh, an article by Kenneth Smith. I hope uh, to see many people there. And for, with that, we'll just have to say good night and have a good, good rest of your evening, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye.